Hello, this is Kevin Prince from BMO Exchange Traded Funds, and I just want to say welcome back to the Market Insights webinar. Appreciate you taking the time and your schedules to join us again today to get some education and some insights in the overall market. And as we say on the show on a regular basis is that really this show has been built upon you and your insights and marketplace that you're asking for. So I'd like to thank everybody who took the time and effort and sent us a question in advance because that kind of stuff not only helps in the existing uh, webinar we're doing, but also helps form the content we develop over time because we want to make sure this is really meeting your needs for these market times. So looking forward to uh, diving the topic today. What we're going to do today is talk about the industry flows in around ETFs and try to get you some insights in regards towards that where the flows are going. Plus, we want to give you some market commentary too to really give you a take a look at some stuff that may not normally see and look a little bit underneath the hood there too. So let's get into it. Let me start off, of course, with a standard disclaimer. Disclaimer is really saying to you that we're not providing advice today. And effectively, we're not providing recommendations. What we're really trying to do is provide you some insights into the overall market itself. And with that, let's get started across the board with our guest speakers. Mackenzie Box is joining us again. Thank you, Mackenzie. Glad to have you back. And then in addition to that, we're going to bring in our strategist around ETFs, Alfred Lee, and he's going to give some market commentaries. So we're going to have Mackenzie cover off the flows and where the money's moving in the industry right now and give you some insights there and then have uh, Alfred, of course, dive in a little more detail and some market commentary. And of course, as we always know, we're going to finish off with the number of questions that uh, came in and we're going to do our best to answer those specific questions. With that, let's get started. Mackenzie, there's a report that we pushed out from BMO ETFs. Oh, I think the beginning of the month, talking about the year uh, semi-annual uh, flows. And some pretty good insights on that. Maybe you can quickly touch base around that as we move through where the money has been flowing in the industry for the last six months. Yeah, thanks, Kevin. And thanks, everyone, for joining today. Um, uh, the ETF uh, industry in Canada has had a record-breaking year, and I think with markets shifting rapidly in response to COVID-19 and increased monetary stimulus um, put forth by the governments, investors have started to turn more to ETFs to navigate the market, and I think they're recognizing the benefits of ETFs through, you know, easy to use single ticket solutions, recognizing their trading efficiency, diversification, and transparency. So I think because of that, um, we've had uh, record-breaking flows uh, thus far this year. And I really like this graphic here on the slide. Um, looking at the dark blue line, that represents the flows for the first half of the year. And the lighter blue uh, representing the later half. So if you look at 2020 thus far, um, you can see that we've already shattered records for flows for this year. So um, 22.4 billion, which is driven primarily from uh, equities, which accounted for roughly 15 billion, and fixed income accounting for uh, just over 5 billion. So uh, we've had a great start to the year. Um, and uh, I think we'll continue to see flows uh, going towards ETFs given market volatility. Well, it's also nice to see that the, the industry itself continues to build and build and build year over year. And these are not just BMO flows, the overall industry flows when it comes to ETFs. So that's also a, a, a good sign for the industry itself. But wow, look at, look at the growth so far this year. Yeah. Now, Mackenzie, that was the first six months. Of course, another month has passed. So let's jump into uh, overall flows and conversation around flows. Let's first talk about you know the volume itself because there's net assets, which you just showed, like because the net assets are growing. But in addition to net assets, is kind of the, the two-way flow that goes back and forth. And maybe give you some insights around that. Share, show yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. So. Yeah, sure. And I think uh, you know total equities are are the dominant part of the market and. ETFs are always going to participate and move with the market. Um, so just looking at the red line, uh, that's the volume of trading uh, the ETFs relatively to the marketplace. Um, and if you look along here, you can kind of see that um, during the contraction or during the correction of uh, the market, ETFs were played pretty heavy. And now that you know things have come off a little bit. Uh, we're starting to see things normalize a little bit. 
Um, so when trading volumes were at the highest, we saw ETFs participate in that. And now they've kind of moved back to normal ranges and you know, people are, are shifting to um, likely some, some single stock exposures as well. Makes a lot of sense when people are trying to put that trade on quickly, that liquid ETF, you know, kind of showcases an easy way to put that trade on, whether you want to grab a broad market or a certain sector. And yeah, more more stabilizing now when it comes to flow and watching that green line kind of cascade back to the more normal range. Let's take a look now, Mackenzie, specifically company perspective, asset perspective, and dive in a little bit of detail in regards to flows from the beginning part of the year. And again, thanks to National for their research for this. Yeah, so here's a quick uh, snapshot of the ETF providers in Canada. So currently there are 36 providers and I think, you know, each month um, we see more products coming to market and we've also seen a lot of new providers come to market in the last couple of years too. So this number um, continues to grow, um, but just looking at the chart, you can really see uh, the dominant players in the industry and, you know, BMO and iShares really stand out there. Um, and during the correction, we saw a lot of these flows go into, um, you know, the top four, five providers, if you will. Um, and I, I think that's something you see kind of across the board. So not just in the Canadian marketplace, but also in the U.S. Um, a lot of times these bigger providers get the largest flows because they have uh, a broad product lineup, quality products, higher trading volume. So naturally you see more money flowing into those, those providers. Um, but just looking and highlighting here, uh, you can see for this year, um, BMO ETFs and iShares are really leading the charge. Uh, we're actually just ahead, um, building on our nine years of being number one in net new flows. So we're on track for that this year as well. Well, thanks for that. And it's just, it's just interesting for somebody to take a look at the scale of the Canadian ETF industry as it, as it cascades down across the board. Let me, uh, let's jump into a little bit of a, a viewpoint on, you know, not just the company perspective, but actually where the flows are going when it comes to, you know, uh, asset classes. Yeah. And I, th I mentioned it earlier, but, you know, equities still are, are kind of the main um, attributor to, to flows and we often see most of the money going there. Um, you know, fixed income, you're also seeing a large, uh, a large amount of money going there as well. And I think um, we mentioned this on one of our previous webinars, but I think when you look at fixed income ETFs, that further exemplifies the benefits of ETFs for transparency, liquidity. Um, so we are seeing a lot of the flows go directly to equities and fixed income. Um, you know, people are looking for opportunity and want to take advantage of the market and then fixed income where people are looking for that protection. Uh, I would say, too, we're also seeing a little bit more flows into the multi asset. So uh, thinking back to our session from last week, so some of the asset allocation ETFs um, that are relatively new to the market, we are seeing more flows pick up there as people look towards single uh, ticket solutions. Um, just of note, our ETFs, uh, the, the ones that we spoke about last week, um, ZCon, ZGrow, and ZBAL, um, and just in one quarter, they're up 15% based on flow. So uh, we are starting to see people shift more towards those one ticket solutions as well. Yeah, certainly a good uh, diversification as you add that to your portfolio across the board. Hey, quickly also to the commodities, is that basically more of the gold trade, right? If I saw that. Really yes, right? and, I, and I think, yeah, and you know, you're gonna see that kind of uptick, um, especially in the recent months, um, as everyone, we've seen a lot of people allocating towards gold. So let's go down even a little bit further, because that's where we're certainly seeing the flows, and it's basically a diversified mix with, you know, a little more tilt towards commodities than normal. And um, let's take a look at underneath the hood a bit here, the geographical mix plus the sector mix across the board, kind of give people a little more insights of where this money's been flowing to get them thinking about their own portfolio construction. Yeah, so looking at the top graph, um, you can see Canada and US really being the dominant players of where money's going. Um, Canada slightly trailing behind the US. Um, but that's that's really a common theme we'd see um, as, you know, a lot of people have a home bias um, 
and allocate a uh, majority of their funds towards you know Canada or the US. Uh, so that's kind of across the industry. Um, we are seeing quite a bit of pickup in developed markets as well. Um, that being more of an institutional trade. Um, so thinking markets like EFI. Uh, so we've seen quite of quite a lot of flows into our EFI ETF, which is uh, ZEA. Um, and then just rounding down to um, table 16 here. Um, we've also seen money flow into different um, sectors. So, and this is an interesting thing to look at throughout the year. Um, you know, banks, uh, the yields are strong. So we're seeing a lot of people allocate towards banks, materials, um, real estate, we're hearing a lot about healthcare. Um, so I think people are looking at these as complements to their portfolio and given um, Given the markets, I think uh, people are finding complements to their portfolio and or maybe tilting towards um, a particular sector where they see uh, opportunity. Um, and then just shifting to table 17 on the slide here, um, you know, we're seeing a lot of the money going into cap weighted, um, but we are seeing money go elsewhere too uh, into, you know, your dividend and, and low vol ETFs, as well as thematics. So thinking like your ESG. Again, just I think this is a lot of investors looking for um, complements to their portfolio or tilting their portfolio um, if they're looking for that additional income uh, through dividend or they want to be, um, you know, they want that low vol exposure as well. Well, thanks, Evan. Yeah, see, it's definitely um, it's interesting to also see the. The flows in the bottom of the chart there of technology and energy. Those are, um, you know, technology shows from its strength and energy, um, you know, maybe coming back a little bit, I guess. And uh, people are starting to see that and executing that thought process through uh, ETFs across the board. You know, that's a good snapshot of, of well, one more thing then. Let me talk about fixed income too, for that matter, you know, because we covered the equity piece. Let's make sure we dive a little more detail on the fixed income side too, if we can. Yeah. And, Again, um, broad market, uh, again, you're gonna see majority of the flows to so the Canadian aggregate. Um, uh, so simply looking at ZAG or XBB, you know, these are the top performing mandates in fixed income. Uh, consistently strong uh, performance, um, you know, at eight basis points, they're a solid performer and, and a great addition to portfolio. Um, we're also seeing a lot of, um, flow into the cash alternative. Uh, and I think what that's really indicating is, you know, there's cash on the sideline. Um, people are waiting to deploy some of their money. Um, and then we're also seeing um, global, um, quite a bit of flows there, but I think that's broadly attributed to institutional flows in this space. Yeah, that's some pretty good insight there too, especially when you think of the broad market. I think it, when you see in the broad market, I think people are understanding that you know, diversification really matters in this marketplace. Having a little bit of different credit qualities and different term structure makes sense. And then to your point, yeah, having the, it's just to see the cash on the sideline starting to build up, even within the ETF space itself specifically. That's a pretty good insights to the flows itself. And I think it also helps people understand where the money's going to. And more recently, as you look at your portfolio construction, I'm going to shift gears here. I'm going to bring Alfred into it because Alfred runs some strategies for us and actually is our strategist at BMO ETFs. And, and he looks at different perspectives in the marketplace. But I think well, let's start off the backdrop there if we can, Alfred. It's maybe a little about the economy and more specifically of, you know, we all know about the unemployment rate being high. Maybe we can start off there and give us that backdrop and maybe what why people are pushing money in these certain flows. And then also as we move through these ones, start to think about, where position people might think about going forward as we go through it. So let's start off with the, the market itself. Sure, thanks, Kevin. Uh, and I, I think this is a, you know, a common question that comes up. I think a lot of people are asking, you know, why the markets continue to rally, um, especially when the econ economic backdrop, especially when you look at unemployment. Um, you know, unemployment right now is running at 13%, both in the U.S. and Canada. Uh, so this is the highest level we've seen in Canada since 1982. Um, and the highest level on record in the U.S. as well. So a lot of people are just wondering, you know, why are we seeing the markets rally? Uh, so when you look at the S&P 500, we basically are uh, at, you know, the February kind of pre-COVID levels at this point. The TSX is a little bit further behind, but, you know, if we keep trending at this level. It, it certainly feels like uh, the TSX will get there within a couple of months. But 
overall, I think uh, I think a lot of people they they have been pricing in uh, an ultimate disaster scenario. Uh, we think you know over the short term, at least for the top portion, uh, see markets are going to behave more like you know, it's, it's almost like they're viewing this as a natural disaster. I think what a lot of people are focused on right now is is basically the jobless numbers and you know, the way i would characterize this is basically you know there's a number type of a number of different types of job losses there's ones that are temporary i think think of you know restaurant uh, workers that are coming back online right now as the economy opens up uh, but then there's certainly economies or industries that are you know that have been changed forever so corporate real estate uh, work from home being a good example of that um, so that's going to uh, change forever, and then and then you have jobs you know that are going to be lost forever. You know, as you see consolidation in certain industries. Um, so I think what we're seeing right now with basically a lot of those jobless numbers are giving positive surprises, uh, just because you know a lot of those temporary uh, jobs are coming back online. So that ultimately will uh, you know that momentum of, of positive surprises in in the jobless numbers will eventually. Uh, that momentum will eventually fade, uh, but ultimately, I think you know, the big question is, um, you know, why are the markets continuing continuing to rally? And, you know, overall, it's, it's because you know central banks for sure have been providing liquidity, um, but I, I think you know, as I mentioned before, as some of the temporary jobs uh, come back online, uh, you know, the focus is going to shift more towards uh, you know about those permanent changes in industries and so on and so forth. Um, so, you know, right now, if you look at the market and you look at kind of the underlying relationships on the market, it's pretty interesting because you look at, um, you know, the uh, kind of the relationships in the market right now. What, what we're finding right now is that, you know, the lower quality assets, which have performed well off of the market bottom. So in, in March and April, um, those are starting to fade now. And what we're starting to see is you know, higher quality assets start to outperform. So. Um, you know, in the last couple of months, it was more about, it, it wasn't so much about, you know, which part of the market you owned. It, it was more about, you know, whether you own the market or not. But I think going forward, it's going to be more important in terms of, you know, which part of the market are you owning? Uh, you know, which exposure do you have uh, to the market? Um, so I think, you know, going forward, as we head into Q3, uh, you, people have to be a little bit more selective in terms of, you know, which part of the market they own. And I think, you know, the beauty of the ETF is that it allows investors to, you know, quickly recharacterize their portfolio uh, and efficiently get access to, you know, different style factors such as low volatility, quality, uh, and different sectors within the economy as well. So, Alfred, let's get into that. I mean, because I think you're right. I mean, there's a certain number of things that you've been, I like your report you produce, and for me and the team is that you start to look at things to watch for across the board. And one of the things you're watching off the bat is that volatility, uh, VIX structure itself. Maybe give the insights to the uh, the listeners here too about what you're looking at, what you're thinking about when it comes to volatility in the, in, the, in the coming future. Yeah, sure. So I think a lot of people when they, you know, they try to gauge, um, you know, what's the sentiment in the market? Uh, are people being fearful or or is the market calm? Uh, they generally point towards the VIX, which you know is, is a measure of volatility in the market. Uh, that's an important measure, uh, but it's also important to see, you know, where the future of volatility is being priced in. So uh, that's essentially looking at the VIX term structure. So uh, essentially, what that tells you is, you know, where's the market uh, gauging volatility in one month, two months, three months, uh, and et cetera. So if you look at the term structure of the VIX, that essentially tells you. Uh, what the market is uh, expecting for volatility in the future. Uh, so in this chart over here, uh, what you'll notice is that you see this peak in October, uh, and what the market is anticipating at this point is basically uh, volatility, or, or we're going to eventually run into some speed bumps. And, and the reason why is because you know, if you think about November, uh, what we have then is you know, the U.S. presidential elections uh, in October. Uh, we also have you know one month of, of kids going back to school. Uh, which also means back to work for a lot of people as well. So potentially another another wave of of uh, coronavirus. Um, so overall, uh, that's why we're seeing uh, the market anticipate you know volatility in Q3. Uh, so again, you know, just going back to uh, my point before, I think you know going forward, it it, it just matters. It's going to matter more in terms of you know which part of the market uh, you own. So I think. Uh, you know, some things that people want to consider is that if volatility is going up, it's always good to think about, 
um, you know, defensive exposures in your portfolio. So, you know, do you have exposure to low volatility? Do you have exposure to quality? And then also, I think one thing that often gets overlooked in, in the recent market is uh, bonds. So I think um, with yields where they are right now, a lot of people say, you know, why do I own bonds or why do I need to own bonds? Um, I could just get, you know, yield through dividend paying stocks, uh, which have a much higher yield and are more tax efficient as well. Uh, but the reason why is because, you know, bonds provide this uh, negative correlation to risk assets such as equities, uh, credit, and so on and so forth. Um, so government bonds are also, even though they don't yield much at this time, uh, from a portfolio construction point of view, uh, government bonds do play a very critical role in terms of building uh, a sound portfolio. And of course, I think, too, if you look at it and maybe get your thoughts on it, if you think volatility is going to rise there are products out there that do benefit from rising volatility like uh, cover calls and you know products that use derivative based structures in there as as as, as a way to enhance uh, income across the board so that's also something that uh, people can factor in in the future if they want that uh, exposure of course alfred let's talk about you know you certainly did take a look at uh, where the market was moving when it comes to respect of beta and beta, bear with everybody here, beta is just a measure, measurement of volatility across the board. So in market volatility itself specifically, you've seen beta, of course, come up and start to move slightly more down. Maybe give some insight about that and why you're watching that specifically. Yeah, so, you know, as you mentioned, uh, beta is basically a measure of uh, a stock's uh, sensitivity to uh, market movement. So a stock that has a higher beta is going to be more volatile uh, than the market and something that has a lower beta, of course, means that it's going to be less volatile than the market. And why I think this is important is because, you know, typically when you come off of a market trough, so coming off of market bottom, typically the high beta stocks tend to outperform. Um, but as that kind of rally kind of uh, progresses and kind of matures, what you find is that low, lower beta stocks uh, start to take over. So we're already starting to see that where, you know, that outperformance in higher beta stocks is already starting to fade. Um, so I think, uh, you know, over the next uh, couple months, uh, low volatility, which tended to be very in vogue uh, over the last decade, I think, you know, low volatility, there's still a good long case, uh, long-term case uh, for low volatility, because I think, you know, if we look at demographics, for example, uh, you know, you have aging demographics around the world, which uh, tends to be where most of the investable assets are. Uh, so because of that, you have this kind of wide scale de-risking. And then when you look at kind of how, you know, risk behaves over the last decade, um, you know, I would say after 2008, you know, the amount of risk that you take isn't really rewarded anymore. Back in 2008, it was almost like risk and reward was more of a linear relationship. Uh, but because we have this aging demographic now, um, you know, in many cases, uh, you know, that relationship between risk and reward is not a linear kind of relationship anymore where uh, certain times when you take on too much risk, it's also uh, very detr detrimental to, to a portfolio. So, you know, again, we, we think in this kind of environment, uh, low volatility uh, certainly uh, is well positioned uh, just because we have you know, that trend in um, aging demographics. And again, you know, I think uh, with the innovation that we've seen in the ETF world uh, over the last, you know, 10 years, um, you know, ETFs are a good vehicle, not only in getting uh, exposure to traditional kind of market cap weighted products, uh, but also different style factors and, and low volatility being a good example of that. Thanks for that, Alfred. Good thing to watch. Volatility is coming down a bit, but then how to access it across the board, but specifically the volatility in regards towards higher beta versus lower beta. You know, Alfred, you know, certainly uh, some things else you've been watching on, and of course, I think a lot of listeners here certainly follow it too, is uh, the trend when it comes to gold prices. It came off more recently for that matter too. So maybe give us a little insight of what you're what you're watching when it comes to gold across the board and you've got a chart here on spot gold and uh, uh, and on equity gold for that matter yeah so gold is you know once again it's it's very topical right it's almost like gold becomes very topical uh, every 10 years or so but it it certainly has its own cycle and that's what we're seeing right now um you know gold recently broke above $2000 and then 
I uh, consolidated back down to $1,900. So uh, there's been a lot of questions in terms of, you know, is the, is the running gold over? Um, but, you know, from our point of view, it, it's basically, uh, you know, when gold hit 2000, there was, lo- there was a lot of what we call technical selling at that point. Um, think about it this way, is that a lot, a lot of people that were early on in the trade in gold uh, bought it at a lower level, uh, but mentally they have a price pegged into their head saying that, you know, when I when gold hits two thousand dollars, I'm going to start selling or at least take some profits uh, and reduce my position in gold. Uh, and that's essentially what we're seeing at this point. Uh, we're seeing some consolidation, but overall, I think, you know, when you look at the reasons why you want to own own gold, uh, gold gold is essentially a hedge against you know three different uh, risk factors. It's it's a hedge against uh, macroeconomic risk. Uh, it's a hedge against U.S. dollar. Uh, it's a hedge against inflation as well. So overall, you know, when you look at um, you know, the macro risk, macro risk is certainly fading at this point, uh, but U.S. dollar continues to, to weaken at this point. Um, there's no inflation on record technically, uh, but we are seeing some wide scale debasement uh, with currency. So, you know, if you look at the longer term trends in gold, um, you know, you see central banks kind of diversifying away from U.S. dollars right now uh, by buying gold. Um, so we've seen that uh, trend with a lot of central banks. Um, but also, you know, as I mentioned before, uh, you see a lot of currency debasement right now, right? So you see you know, not only the U.S. dollar dropping, but all kind of other currencies uh, dropping as well. So, you know, central banks right now, they are increasing their balance sheet, which increases the monetary supply and circulation. Um, so technically, you could argue that, you know, the price of gold isn't going up. Um, it's almost like a fixed rate, but the prices of all currencies are going down. So it looks like gold is going up. Um, so... Overall, um, there's, a bit, there's a lot of questions in terms of, you know, whether you should get your exposure uh, to gold uh, in, in gold bullion or, or gold stocks and which one is better. It really depends, right? So I, I would say, you know, gold bullion, if you're looking at it from a portfolio construction point of view, uh, gold bullion is certainly better because it's going to be negatively correlated. Uh, but if you're bullish on gold, and you, if you believe gold prices will continue to go up, and gold stocks, I would argue, is a, is a better, uh, is, is more fitting for that point of view because, um, you know, think about it this way. Uh, a gold company uh, essentially mines, mines for gold right now, but they're selling gold in the future. So uh, if you think or if the, market, if the market believes gold prices are going up to $2,500, and that's a hypothetical price, um, and gold is at $2,000 right now. They're mining gold right now, but they're selling it at $2,500, or, or the market is pricing in a future price of $2,500. So, you, so by investing in gold stocks, you're getting that inherent leverage uh, through the operational um, you know, balance sheet of those gold uh, companies. So there is a difference between you know, how to get your exposure to gold, and they certainly have different uh, pros and cons. Thanks for that, Alfred. Let's also take a look at, you know, you, you've been watching China and specifically around the A shares and the resurgence around there. Now, maybe a lot of listeners don't know what A shares are. Give us a little background on that and then what you're specifically looking at there. Yeah, so, you know, there's, uh, you know, Chinese stocks are, are a little bit different just because, uh, you know, the Chinese economy is closed. Um, so for you know, people in the mainland and inside China, they invest in A shares, which are the locally listed shares. Um, however, there are, you know, um, certain Chinese companies that list on the Hong Kong exchange, for example, that is open to the rest of the world. Uh, those are called H shares. And then there's also American Depositor Receipts or ADRs. Uh, those are essentially uh, listed on the U.S. exchanges, but they all provide exposure to Chinese companies. So in many cases, uh, some companies have both A shares and H shares and maybe ADRs as well. So what we look at is we, we basically look at the relationship uh, between you know, those companies that have um, you know, stocks listed in both A shares and H shares as well. And what we've noticed is that the A shares have rallied, whereas the H shares have not. Um, so ADRs, uh, I would say, trade more in line with, with H shares. Um, so, you know, a lot of people are kind of, you know, becoming a little bit more bullish on China at this point. Um, so I think, you know, when you want to get exposure to China, you know, just, you know, do your due diligence in terms of knowing how you're going to get that exposure. Uh, but I would argue, you know, going through H shares and ADRs 
uh, they're trading at a discount right now relative to the eight shares. Um, so that's potentially, you know, a, potentially a more efficient way to get it if you believe that uh, eight shares have rallied too much uh, a court, uh, relative to uh, eight shares and ADR. So I would say most of the ETFs listed in uh, North America uh, tend to get their exposure through ADRs and eight shares. Um, there are a few that do get exposure through A shares, uh, but of course, you know, before you make an investment, uh, always, you know, look under the hood and know how that ETF is getting that exposure. Thanks for that, Alfred. And what we'll quickly do here, because we want to get to a couple questions, but I really want to highlight one thing that you tend to look at is kind of the good, the bad, and the ugly, the marketplace. Maybe just give you, I mean, one or two thoughts, please, on the what you think of the good, what's good in the market right now that you're liking. Maybe what's bad yeah. kind of stuff you're kind of watching and ugly, what you're really kind of putting sure. on your hot list. So, you know, yeah, why don't I just break it down to, you know, the uh, macro, fundamental, and technical, and you will, we'll give our views in, in each of those uh, very quickly. So, you know, with the macroeconomic backdrop, I think right now is very good. Uh, but heading into Q3, you know, as I mentioned before, with the U.S. presidential election, uh, COVID potentially a second wave, um, you know, right now, um, you know, the macroeconomic backdrop is good and improving, but come Q3, uh, we potentially have this binary effect where it could get really good or it could get, you know, a little bit worse. So, um, you know, it really depends on those two events and, and how those play out. Uh, from a technical perspective, you know, we're, we're watching a number of relationships in the market right now. So low vault to high beta, uh, quality stocks to the S&P 500 and, and investment grade bonds versus uh, high yield bonds as well. Uh, what we're noticing is that um, you know a lot of higher quality assets are starting to outperform now. Uh, so that that essentially tells us that you know, a lot of the easy gains that we're seeing in the market, as we saw in you know March and April of this year, uh, those easy, those easy gains are essentially gone. So again, investors have to be a little bit more selective and look at you know higher quality assets at this point as well. Uh, from a fundamental perspective, I'd say. You know, valuations, uh, they're getting a little bit rich at this point. But again, um, you know, if you look at things from a price to earnings perspective, it's really tough to gauge still in terms of knowing where earnings are for certain companies. Um, so re it's really tough to gauge, you know, where valuations are right now. So, you know, overall, we would argue that if you are looking at fundamentals and valuations of companies, um, just make sure, you know, one way to play this is if you don't know where the earnings are, uh, just invest in higher quality assets. And if you have those companies that do have um, competitive advantages in their fields, you know, over the long haul, you would think that, you know, that's certainly a good way to to play this, uh, play this market. Well, thanks for that, Alfred. I appreciate your thoughts. Now we're going to shift gears from here. I appreciate both you and Mackenzie giving us both where the market flows have been. And that, of course, you know, some views about positioning on a go forward basis. As always, we have a bunch of questions that came in. We're going to have to go through just a few this time because uh, we went a little longer. But that being said, let me see if we can answer just a couple off this one, and we're going to save the other ones for next week. No problem. First and foremost, uh, maybe I'll bring Alfred in this one, and I'll kind of I'll, maybe I'll, I'll tackle the first part. I might use you for the second part there, Alfred. Really, like how does currency hedging work is really the first question. Because, you know, you, you have these ETFs in Canada that hedge out the movement of the currency. So, you know, when you look at uh, a security out there, uh, Apple being a good example, the key thing to think about with those kind of stocks is that you have a position in Apple itself, of course, but inherently because it's priced in US dollars, you also have a position in the US dollars. Now, what do Canadian ETF providers do? We effectively mitigate that position in the US dollars and just leave behind the position for you in the company itself. So your call, of course, across the board with your hedged or unhedged, but really what the hedged ETF is mitigating the movement of the currency, leaving behind just the equity. Now, for to you, certainly taking a look in the marketplace, um, where, where would one position himself or there's things to think about when it comes to Canada versus US dollars, specifically maybe around the S&P itself, the S&P 500? Um, yeah, so there's there's a number of things uh, you should be looking for, but you know, overall, I, I would say you know I would, I would start off by saying that you know what what the kind of 
you know, objective of the various kind of currency formats is, is that, you know, to your point, when you invest in, the, in an ETF that tracks you know, the S&P 500 without a currency hedge, you're taking on both the stock exposure and also the currency exposure as well. So you have to consider, you know, how that U.S. dollar is going to perform relative to Canadian dollars. A hedge ETF allows an investor to invest in the U.S. market as if they're a U.S. investor. So the point of a currency hedge ETF is that it's supposed to allow you to not, you know, worry about currency. It's supposed to allow you to invest in the local market as if you are a local investor. But, um, you know, it really depends on, you know, what an investor is looking for. So uh, if they don't want to deal with currency, I would say currency hedging is, is the better choice. Uh, however, if they, they are bullish about the U.S. and if they are bullish about the U.S. dollar, um, going without the currency hedge is a better option. I would say right now, uh, just because, uh, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty in the U.S. Uh, the U.S. dollar, we have seen a lot of investors move into the currency hedge uh, format and not have to worry about that noise in currency, uh, not have to worry about, you know, what they're going to do with their monetary policy and, and what's going to go on with the U.S. elections as well. So a lot of people have moved towards currency hedge, and, and that's certainly a good way to play it. Thanks for that, Alfred. We have time for uh, just one more. So we'll probably close off on gold here, if you don't mind. Um, you know, certainly adding gold, but just, you know, kind of get more pers perspective here on gold stocks versus gold bullion. Um, you know, and then in platinum, maybe not go to the platinum piece, but just simply talk about, uh, you know, thoughts on, actually, thoughts on gold versus gold bullion, uh, gold miners versus gold bullion. Yeah. So as I mentioned before, I think, um, you know, it really depends on, you know, what you're trying to, um, you know, what your objective is. If, if you're trying to build a portfolio that uh, is well diversified, I would argue that gold bullion is, is a better way to look at it. Um, however, uh, if you are bullish on gold, I would say gold companies is, you know, the better way to play it. As I mentioned before, I think, you know, when you invest in gold companies, you have to, the, the market essentially prices in the future price of gold. Uh, one thing I would say is that, um, you know, during a market sell-off, if we do see a wide-scale deleveraging event, as we saw in uh, March of this year, as we saw in 2008, um, gold stocks behave more like stocks during a sell-off. Coming off of the market bottom, as gold prices start to rally, however, that's when you start to see gold, gold stocks outperform. But, uh, you know, one caveat is that, again, uh, during a market sell-off, uh, gold equities behave like equities. Thanks for that, Alfred. And thanks for that, Mackenzie, too. Sorry we couldn't get to all the questions today. Don't worry. We're going to save them. We're going to answer them next week. No problem whatsoever. And feel free to please, if you have more questions in the market or more questions you want insights around ETFs, please send them in because, again, it helps us build this content for this show specifically for you. And that's about as much time we have today. I'm going to say thank you for joining us. I'll let you know next week. We're going to spend time talking about alternatives in the marketplace. And if you think about that, what is that? You have equities, you have fixed income. Well, really an alternative is another way of complement your portfolio and really more diversifying your portfolio. Certainly becoming a lot more of a bigger discussion nowadays. So we're going to spend some time next two shows and dive into alternatives as a way to complement your portfolio. Look forward to joining you next week, Friday at 1 o'clock, August 21st. Have yourself a good week ahead. Cheers.